Good evening. It's wonderful to see you all here. My name is Jessica Flynn, and I am a literary arts specialist at the National Endowment for the Arts, which sponsors the poetry and prose stage here at the National Book Festival. I could not be more thrilled to be introducing Nathan Englander to you today. In Nathan Englander's hard-to-put-down new novel, Cottage.com, a son grieves the death of his religious father. Knowing he bears the responsibility for reciting the Jewish prayer for the dead for the next 11 months, he stumbles upon the website Kaddish.com and realizes that, well, there's a way to outsource that obligation. In his characteristic way, Nathan dives into his subject matter with writing that is inventive and darkly funny and allows you to see straight through to the heart of his characters. Though the book explores big themes, identity, faith, guilt, redemption, there were times reading the book that I was so immersed in the story and the writing seemed so effortless that I nearly forgot I was reading as I turned the pages. Nathan Englander grew up in Long Island in an observant Jewish family, though he now describes himself as secular. He said that Kaddish.com is the book he's been waiting his whole life to write, one that brought him back to where he started. He's also the author of four other books, including the novel Dinner at the Center of the Earth, which came out just a little over a year ago, very impressive, and the short story collection What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He was named one of the 20 writers for the 21st century by The New Yorker, and his work has been translated into 20 languages. Nathan is also a translator himself, most recently of the New American Haggadah, created in collaboration with Jonathan Safran Foer. He teaches creative writing at New York University and lives with his wife and young daughter and son, um, where since becoming a parent, he says he's lost his ennui time and does a lot of nighttime writing to get his work in. In conversation with Nathan today is the very funny and smart Glenn Weldon. He is a regular panelist on NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast and reviews books, movies, comics, and more for the NPR Arts Desk. He is the author of two books, Superman, the Unauthorized Biography, and The Caped Crusade, Batman and the Rise of Nerd Culture. And he is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts, Arts Journalism Fellowship, among other honors. I am very much looking forward to this conversation. Please welcome Nathan Englander and Glenn Weldon. So Nathan. Hi, Glenn. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. There's, uh, yeah, so much to do here. Thanks. So much to do and so little time. So um, the Jews. Yes. <laughs> it's a good opening, right? Yes. Um, in the anti-Semitic hour. <laughs> so in the Jewish tradition, I'm going to go explain to you for a yes, second. Yes, exactly. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, there, is, there are the rules and there is the immediate reflexive uh, intrinsic questioning of those rules, in yes. intellectual interrogation of yes. those rules, which is how you end up with something like the Shabbos Goy. Yes. The Shabbos Goy, if you don't know, is uh, if the rule says you can't light a stove or push an elevator button on Saturday, you hire or you, uh, you befriend. You hint. You hint. <laughs> Uh, to get somebody to do it for you. Yes. It, it is the original workaround. Yes. Uh, and you've written a book about a workaround, about yes. a man who tries to, to find a workaround for grief. Yes. Yeah. Uh, t tell me, where did that come from? Uh, I know Glenn for so long, young as we look, but uh -huh. it's, uh, he goes, uh, that's right to the core of my psyche, uh, <laughs> that question of where that came from. And by the way, uh, that, thank you for that introduction, Jessica. Yes. And it, I thought it was totally unfair for her to ask you guys to be on point with your questions because my answers are totally like rambling and confused. Yeah, so I, all I, have I to was do, like, oh, if you bring your A game, I will bring my you will A see, game. All I have to do is press play and sit back. <laughs> yes, so, yes. Yeah. And thank you uh, for signing. Uh, all interpreters that I have end up hating me. Uh, mostly they just have to sign or say in many languages, did not finish sentence. Um, <laughs> makes things really hard. Um, but, but they, anyway. So, okay, uh, yeah, he no, didn't no, actually no. outsource grief. He, yes. he outsourced the, the, the manifestation of yes. grief, the observance so, of the rules. So I'm, I guess, I, you know, 
as God said, I grew up in this super religious world, uh, um, or, you know, again, if you're more religious, then you'll be like, you're not even Jewish, because that's how I grew up. There was a rabbi who tortured us all. People are either have beards to the floor or are radically secular from him, but he used to say, anyone more religious than me is a fanatic, which I liked as uh -huh, a line. Uh -huh. We didn't think we were so religious. It looks really religious to me now. Uh, I am obsessed with rules. I am not made for current day America or the planet. Like, I, if, if there was a broken light in the desert, like it was on red, and I could see a thousand miles in both directions, and there was a little bridge for the turtles and salamanders, I knew I wasn't, <laughs> I, you would find me dead at the wheel. Like, I can't <laughs> break a rule. And, and I guess what I both like, tortures me as an adult, but I find also really beautiful about like super traditional Judaism is they just, there are solutions. So first you ask the most and then you go from there. And that's uh, the Shabbos Goy is the perfect example, but we just, you make things work. So mm -hmm. first you say, okay, if you wanna get married, you have to do this, this, and this, and you have to go to the mikvah and you have to do it. And you're like, okay, I'm not doing any of that. And they're like, okay, jump over a broom. We'll go pagan, right, you know, right, 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 we're right. gonna get you there. Right. So I guess I was thinking, uh, uh, if you write fiction, uh, if it bends, it's, we don't quote Woody Allen anymore. Yeah, no, we don't anyway, quote Woody Allen. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, fiction is, for me, it's where I make sense of the world, and it's, it's a place to, I guess, explore extremes and, and to look about, I get, it just, the modern world seeps into your brain. This isn't a political book, it's, it's outside that, but my obsession with truth and your word counting and loyalty, and you look for the most extreme form that a story could handle, and I couldn't think of anything larger than the prayer for the dead and what that means in a family if one person is religious and the other isn't. Right. Like, in the very first chapter, on page two, you do a thing which I call cheating out. Uh, we talked about this last time. Cheating out is a performance term, which means we're talking, but if there's an audience, we kind of angle our bodies or our chairs out slightly so that you guys can see. And you are in the, you're, you're writing about a community that is relatively small, that has its own ways, that uh, ways that to the outside world might seem arcane. So what you have to do as a writer is cheat out. And what you do in, uh, and, and people do this terribly in films when they say, uh, well, you forget, uh, we went to high school together, which yeah. that's not a thing. I, that's say. what I was holding in my head. I was just gonna yes, use exactly. the example of like, since I know you from grad school, Glenn. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. I'm your sister, remember? Yes. Like that kind of thing. <laughs> yes. um, so, so what you do is you, you have him go outside and sit in a chair. Yes. And then his sister comes back and says, you sat, you, sat in, you sat in the wrong chair. You sat the wrong way in a chair. Uh, how conscious are you as you're writing of the need to, to speak about such specific things to an audience that is not familiar with the bylaws. Oh, joy. Uh, <laughs> literally, uh, the, even the word cheating, like, there's st I write plays now. Uh, I've got another one that I'm about to work on, and like, I almost fainted the first day of rehearsal because I'm like, wait, four people have to have dinner, but they all have to face this way? Yeah. Like, it has to be organic. I teach at NYU, as was said, my whole job, I just scream at the student's introduction of information. I cannot stand an inorganic word that seems unnatural mm -hmm. or meant to do work. That is so, so, so upsetting to me. So I think, yes, it, it's, I mean, that's, I'm alone in a room all day with me, me pup, you know, and the internet, there's, anyway. But um, I guess, yeah, I am obsessed with that idea of telling the story organically, of it being natural, but it's your job. You have failed your readers if they can't enter a world. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I see it as a dual obligation. When this book, I, you know, I, I actually had to take to my fainting couch. I was like, this is my most Jewish book yet, but if they're all the most Jewish, like, how could this, <laughs> that was like a philosophical question to me. Yeah. But I think work, when you're writing about a specific subject, like it has to seem to the people who know it as if no one who doesn't know it could possibly understand it, and then it also has to be absolutely universal. Right. So I always say, Cormac McCarthy, I love Cormac McCarthy, horses to me are big dogs that you ride. <laughs> you know, I'm sure if you know something about a dappled, I don't know what, I'm sure there's something that makes sense to you as they walk across the sagebrush. I don't, uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Like, I read for one thing, and then for a horse person or a Southwest, it's going to mean sure. something else. I always say I watched uh, The Crown, yeah. you know? It's so good. Like, that's what I'm saying. I love The Crown, but I'm watching, like, who's going to win World War II? Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> if you know British stuff, I was like, you know, uh, Prince Harry, was it Prince Harry? His Nazi uniform is a whole yeah. different costume oh. after you watch The Crown. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. But um, to that point, I am hyper, I, you have to have a bifurcated brain when you write fiction. 
your obligation is only to story. It has to be super insidery and true. They can't be like, as you said, talking at each other. And then it also has to let everybody in or you failed. And I think I, I learned that because, you know, back to when I started writing fiction, there's the wanting to apologize and you see what you need to fight for. Mm -hmm. You know, when an editor, like different countries, my books come with glossaries. I'm like, if that's what you want to do, you know, awesome. Right. But I'm saying, if somebody eats matzah, I'm like, did, there, did blood shoot out their mouth? <laughs> like, did foam come out? Okay, it's not Drano, right. you know, it's right, right. dry, it's probably a crack, like, you can tell. If they eat it in fine, it's probably food. They're not that happy, it's probably <laughs> not the best food. Uh -huh. You know, you can follow story, because I feel like this is only happens with like, uh, Jewish stuff, like African American literature, LGBTQ stuff, it's only, nobody picks up like Candide and says like, can I give this to my non-French friend who's not been disemboweled like Kunigold and dead for 200 years? You know, like you only, it's really, back to, as I teach at a university, so now I'm learning about microaggressions, it's a really sweet right. and beautiful thing, but it's only, like everything we read, we don't understand like that's the point if you read sci-fi like i've been screaming this whole book to about game of thrones like do you have a dragon yeah. are you the mother of dra like it. i followed just fine yeah sure sure i mean uh so larry uh is starts this book he's 30 years old he has left the orthodox community and then a marvelous thing happens uh where he goes back to it spoiler it's like you know spoiler it's not a spoiler one fifth of the way in the book yeah. so uh and the thing that i noticed reading it over again is that Larry is miserable and surely, until something happens, is happy, is yes. home. Now, the, the Nathan Englander I knew when, yes. when we were in our 20s, yes. could he have written a book that is this generous hearted to this community that you had just left? Uh, no, yeah. I definitely couldn't, and thank you, and it's because of people like, he was you know, like my guide, he's like, this is what good food tastes like. You know, he helped <laughs> me with a lot of things, but you know, I could bring my shrink up here, but like, there's things you work on. If you're still upset about like, not getting, now it's funny to me that I sat on the bench, when I got put in the basketball game in high school, I started to pull my sweatpants off, and I was like, I'm not wearing shorts. I so <laughs> never left the bench, I didn't even have a uniform on under there. But I'm saying, if that doesn't become funny to you, yeah. over time, like that's the way you're, I guess, Part of what, uh, I'm in DC, part of what's tearing this country apart, I, I, part of what drove the, uh, the book before this one, I can't believe I have back-to-back -back books, it's unheard of for me, it's mm. just, I saw Joyce Carol Oates downstairs, uh, uh, she has like 30, 31 novels? Jeez, it's more. But I say, if I just, 70? 70, 70. 70 novels, that's right. Phil, so seven, but I always say to Joy, I was like, if I just type them over, it would, I don't think in my lifetime I could just retype them, yeah, even yeah, yeah. if you gave me <laughs> the books. But back-to-back -back books is crazy for me, but I wrote an Israel-Palestine book, and I feel like this is like a weird companion to me in a very different way, but I'm obsessed with a loss of empathy. The world doesn't function. We have societies for a reason. You know what I'm saying? I'm always like, do libertarians call 911 when they have a chainsaw accident? <laughs> and they're like, that's why I pay ta I love to pay taxes. I know that's not popular in this town, but like, I want someone, I lived in Malawi for a year with my, I want, when you dial 911, someone should answer the fucking phone. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, anyway, but, um, yeah, but I think it's a look at, I'm glad if I have more, you can be different, you can be, a, I'm so far from this world. Yeah. I guess this gets back to my family. We are so, my family, my sister wears a wig, like, you know, like our, pol we don't ever talk politics, our worlds are so radically different, but I can't stand that, tolerance is so insulting to right. me. I'm into, like, it's about respect. I can play both sides in my brain, and I, I think it's, again, it's so, we have dual realities now, we're not giving over the whole event to this, but, but I'm very interested in finding space to understand and, you know, have feelings for both sides. Right. So, I, thank you. I think that's really at the core is me getting to the place where, like, yeah. Julia really loves being religious, and I used to love being religious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the, 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 the jump that he makes, uh, the transformation back to uh, uh, orthodoxy, uh, is, yeah. is handled in two pages. Yes. Now, this, this book has a kind of lean, propulsive energy behind it of a short story. It, there is a central mystery, there is an investigation, yes. there is a reveal. Uh, did it start out as a short story that got longer? Was it a longer novel? Because there is no inessential, there's no chaff here. Anything that doesn't really light, uh, go, feed into uh, Shirley's grief journey 
uh, is gone. So what was that process like? Oh, every book feels like the first book. That's, mm -hmm. I always say, like, if I'm a gymnast, like, uh, I have a new baby at home, so I can't say I'm tired after this trip, because my wife's going to be like, you slept in a hotel room. But anyway, <laughs> but I was like, as I limp to get the baby with plantar fasciitis, I'm just saying, if you're a gymnast, uh -huh. your career, like, I, you know, I have a, a, a ballerina friend in New York, like, she's been retired since she's, like, 24. You know, it's like, ah, oh, that was a great career. I'm done now. Yeah. Point is, what I love about writing is, like, it's just this gigantical starting again, and every book feels like the first book. And I was so, thank you for saying it. You're so generous. I hope the book meets Glenn's description. But I guess you think about things on the road. You spend, like, ten, my Argentina novel took me a decade. It wasn't, I didn't even brush my, I had, like, gingivitis at the end. I was just <laughs> writing. <laughs> That's it, you know? Yeah. And it's like, then somebody's like, I had a great afternoon with that book. And it's like, actually, that's a joyous <laughs> thing. If someone's, I wanted this book for people to be like, I sat down and I read it. Yeah. You know, like, I wanted that arc of it stripped down. Yeah, it had a different birth. I had just finished this crazy, mad, like, seven timeline, you know, five continent, like, Israel, Palestine, multi-reality book. And I was like, I just want to write something extraordinarily lean that lean. is a journey. Like, that's the point. The Jewish stuff gets laid on it. It's like a mystery mm -hmm. in a weird way. And yes, it did start out as a short story. In my, it, it was, uh, I'm pausing because I try and be vulnerable up here, but it's so extremely vulnerable. This was the most out of body. It's the first novel that I wrote. I, I'd never thought about how short stories come to me. They come to me like in a dream. They just are. And this is novels, you can't, you can't sit down and read your whole novel. You're not going to get much of a work day if you're writing a 700-page novel. You're like, let me start polishing from word one. Yeah. You know, you have to like build an arc and it has to be an unbroken dream. Point being, this is the first novel that came to me in that same weird, different kind of dream state, and I wanted to explore that. And back to this, tw there's a 20-year jump, mm -hmm. about you know 20 pages in, like that. I'm obsessed with negative space because what makes things, what makes this an event, like it's a miracle, like the. All of us in the room together, there's someone I haven't seen in 20 years that's here from Mantua. It'll, you know, like, that's the last time we saw each, the infinity of putting us all together. Like, what makes, I hope you like this event, but what makes it a joy for me is you don't see, like, 25 years of friendship with us. We're just two people talking the absence of all the stories and all the things and adventures. That's what makes this real. And I think I can't be, I'm not religious anymore. I'm religious about fiction. Right. It, it, it patterns the brain. It literally, if a story is functioning, your brain changes, it becomes memory. I have a, the next play that I'm writing is on my story, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank, and how I wrote that story, why I married that idea to the Carver story, what we talk about when we talk about love, is because I, ha I was writing about these two couples, and then I just had this memory, and I saw a different two couples at a table, like the, I saw the changing light of day, a bottle of gin between them, and I thought, oh my God, that's what story, beca I couldn't tell you anything about that story. I didn't remember there was a doctor or where it is. I, I, didn't, I didn't see words. Mm -hmm. I had a memory and I was like, that's what fiction needs to do is it needs, so yeah, for me, it's about, that's the only thing to deliver is like a complete universe. Right, now you have written about, very movingly in your two previous novels about mothers and sons. Uh, this book is, is essentially about fathers and sons, and you, you've written about that before, you've touched on it in many places. This is a full deep dive into that specific kind of relationship. Yeah. You have just become, months ago, you just became the father to a son. How, what parts of your brain are functioning one way when you're dealing with the father and son relationship versus the mother and son relationship? Uh... Is it rude if I start nursing? Yeah. <laughs> um, let's go full Oedipal. Yeah. Anyway, but, um, uh... The, my milk's coming in. Anyway, <laughs> but, um, uh, oh God, it's so gigantically know, and vastly different. And again, yes, as a parent, but that's the point, your job as a writer is to write everything. You don't have to have, you don't, that's, if there's always writers in the room, there's always people dreaming of being writers. So I want to give you advice I wish someone had told me. I was so sad when I was dreaming of being a writer because I grew up in suburbia. I did have actual parents, but I was mostly, uh, this is what brought Glenn and I together when we understood we were related because we had the same family, which was sitcom repeats. Yeah, yeah, um, you yeah know, exactly. Not even basic cable. So I was like, yeah. if you watch, <laughs> you know, good times, enough times, like, oh, <laughs> these are your relatives. Anyway, but, um, but that idea, I was like, oh, I can't be a writer because all my memories are from the mall or someone else's memories as made into sitcoms, mm -hmm. you know. So yes, I, there's, I'm not going to do any mumbo because it's just not true. 
You know what I'm saying? If you can imagine it, you just have to have feelings. You have to have real feelings. And you can, by the way, I also free you up, many writer friends, you can even be a sociopath. You just have to have real feelings when you're writing. <laughs> Nonetheless, <laughs> honestly, some of those people, you're like, man, you're good on the page, but wow. Anyway, <laughs> uh, as to this point, the father-son relationship is complicated for uh -huh. many sons. I, I think it was about, yes, my daughter was born. I was thinking of the parent uh, relationship and that I've become, uh, I have definitely not said this on stage, but in the 10 years since my father died, I've become so much closer mm -hmm. with him. Mm -hmm. Like your relationships change sometimes after people are gone, you know, like you can understand different choices, different things in life. And I think that was a big thing to explore in this book. The same question that Glenn is asking about the way I like bumped up against religion, I think it's also the same way of how you re-explore relationships over time. Right. And I was ready to explore that. Right. Um, the, 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 I have not read you writing about, I mean, this is not an autobiographical novel, except in the sense that it varies. Except for the fish tank. <laughs> yes, yes, except for the fish tank scene. Uh, I have not read you writing about fathers and sons in the way that I have here. There's a, there's a, there's a, a series of dream sequences which work. Uh, they work because they're coming at this topic from, from a surprising place. Um, what I wanted to ask you, though, is about uh, the character of Shuli, uh, who, uh, when he's Larry, he is miserable. When he's Shuli, uh, up until a certain point, he's happy because um, the reason Larry seems to be miserable is A, the grief, but B, he is not where he should be. He is a person who knows the rules and is ignoring them, and it, that misery doesn't come from not knowing the rules. Yes. That misery doesn't come from uh, not being ignorant of what's expected of you. It comes from knowing exactly what's expected of you and not doing it. So I, I think, and this is, you start to learn over time, like I learned some, when you get to talk to someone brilliant, and uh, I learned so much from readers, someone's gonna ask a question that I take to the next city, and I'd be like, well, I wrote that because of this. Mm -hmm. but, um, but as to Glenn's question, like over time I start to see certain like, uh, uh, I never trust writers and do this, that's how stories get, it's gotta be three dimensional. <laughs> but. Um, I guess there's a certain, I like, the, I like giving mass to a joke. Like, I, it took me a long time to see that, which is like, I used to have long, like picture Sharon Moonstruck, I had these long curls. <laughs> you know, I'd go to my religious sister's house and like the nice married women who wear wigs would say like, I can make such a shade, I can make such a wig out of that hair. And then I thought like, oh, that's a funny joke. And then I was like, oh, but how does that become story? And I right. thought about like a Hasidic woman seeing a man in Manhattan with like gorgeous hair that she just has to have, like Reb Kringle, I, I, you know, I thought about a Hasidic man with the big belly and the white beard who can't afford to pay for a synagogue, so he has to work as Macy's as a Jewish Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. The nicest thing about going on the road, everything I've ever dreamed, if anyone reads it, I have met every Jewish Santa in America. They are a legion. Yep. But um, in the last 20 years. So in this one, I guess there's a great fear in my household about what my true inner self is. Mm -hmm. And I, I was really, like, my wife is just so afraid you're gonna come home and I'll be nailing up like 20 mezuzahs and burning the kitchen <laughs> down and like have, like, uh, pin the tail on the donkey. I'll have nailed new <laughs> payas. I'll get extension payas. Like, <laughs> Like, I, I'm so, I call myself, everyone, uh, back to the Haggadah got mentioned with Jonathan Savernfo, like our vaudevillian roadshow, he'd have me read from my translation, I'd introduce myself as an atheist and radically secular, and then he'd have me read and he'd just say to the audience, have you ever seen a more religious man in your life? You know, <laughs> so I know it's in me and I was thinking that we all get one switch. That's what I was thinking about. You know what I'm saying? You get to come out of the closet, you get to, but you're not supposed to go back in. You know what I'm saying? You can switch political parties once, we're gonna listen to you once, we're not gonna hear your story of going, you know, like, <laughs> choose a side, like, a sports team, you can stop drinking, we won't help you start again, you right. know what I'm saying, like, there's all, like, I left religion, that's my narrative, right. but I thought I like it so much, I was just at my nephew's meeting, man, do I like that screamy, deafening, ecstatic dancing, it's really fun, <laughs> so I thought, like, what about that switch, what about someone who's left, but who knows, who finds their, I, I guess, that's the religious part of my brain. I feel like people do have natures. Right. You know, you can change a lot about yourself, but your nature, I feel like Larry was being, I thought about what rebellion is, and that gets back to Glenn's question of like, if this book being like uh, kinder or, or more, more connected to the religiosity, which is, 
I, I guess I was exploring rebellion, and rebellion is not not caring. It's really hard. Not to care is badass. You know what I'm saying? If you, like, I remember a friend got divorced, and I was like, oh, I didn't know what to say. I saw your wife with her new boyfriend, and he was like, isn't he great? And I was like, you needed to get divorced. You know? <laughs> like, that's not caring. And for me, that was the notion of seeing how much his rebellion at the front of the book is him. It's its its, it's, it's own kind of engagement. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we're close to, we're at the 15 minute mark. I have one last question, then we'll throw it to you. Um, so tell me about the scene where Shuli and Gabrielle, the student, are looking for the cottage.com, the, the place oh. where it came from it. And um, obviously, Shuli is not uh, a, a technocrat. Uh, <laughs> he's, not, he's not big on, on the web. And he, the very notion of Google Street View seems to him like spying. Seems yes. to him like an invasion because he's gone from being Larry, who thinks poorly of everyone, to a man who thinks that even the best, pe even people who are performing in bad faith have have the best intentions. Yes. So he he feels that's an invasion. Talk yes. A little bit about it. Yes. Uh, and uh, you've spoken to me before on and off stage. Back to Glenn. Nicely mentioned the dream thing. I did want to say, yeah. like dreams are central to this book and ideas of heaven that I was, you know, raised with. I did want to take a second for that. Like that's really central to this. I was raised with these terrifying ideas of heaven, which you know connects this internet thing. They're like, oh, when you die, you just watch a movie of your life with God on one side and your mother on the other. They would like torture <laughs> us. A 14-year-old boy doesn't want to hear that. But why dreams, which are not justified in book, are I thought they were so justified. So thank you for their working view. Is because for Jews and a religious Jew and a Jew in Israel, dreams are portents. It's its own reality. So I, I'm very delicate. I'm very careful when a novel, like when someone leans on dreams in a book, it's, it, it has to earn its place. But I thought, yes, Jews and Israel and Egypt and stuff like that, you dream it's for real. Hey. That's one thing. But back to the internet, I guess uh, I was the kid. I wish I was naughtier. You know what I'm saying? I had a very low bedroom. I could have climbed out the window down the garage. I wish I smoked weed and I wish someone had told me like all kinds of things, you know, like I just didn't know to do anything. I was always in trouble for theological questions, which is so embarrassing. <laughs> but that's what they'd be like, Englander, get out. I won't tell the principal, just go get lost, whatever. But just questions. And one of them, uh, I was going to say, like, I'm sure these rabbis are long dead, except then you look at a picture of your like first grade teacher you thought was 90 and you're like, I think she's 30. Anyway. <laughs> This rabbi may be like 50 now, but I think he's probably dead. Right. Anyway, but, uh, but to that notion, I would say like, but this idea of omniscience, like that God could know just this room alone, what every single person in this room has done, what they're doing now and what you're gonna do next, like that to me was too much to ask for the globe. And I think I sort of had to sit back when I was rethinking for this book and say, oh my God, like we've built, and it's old school, it's a Jewish, it's not a New Testament, the internet is mean, but we've built a beta God. Like it's not, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's not that I open my Instagram and it knows that the house needs groceries, it's that like, my daughter has said to my wife, who has said to me, like, if you're running out, we need green tortellini. It's not like I get an ad for tortellini. I get an ad for the green tortellini. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it is, that's terrifying, and it happens. I have so many examples. I was noting them when I was writing this book, like, hyper-specific things, you know. I think I knew from Instagram that my wife was pregnant with our son before she did. I'd be like, get a diaper ad. I was like, oh, we better go get a test. <laughs> you know, like... It's so crazy. But yes, I just want to think of what we built and what we wrought and what it's doing to us as a society. Because there, there's a pornography moment in this book, you know, that like echoes where he wants to, surely wants to put everything right. That's the journey in the book. Fix it with his father, with his student, with his wife, with his friends, with his sister. And one thing is, you know, at this, you know, porn clip that he's looked with the woman in the thing, because I thought that's the most pressurized form, which is, I just, I, like on late night TV, you'll turn on one of these, you know, shows like whatever, Conan or something, and they'll be making, someone will have like looked at their phone and then, you know, fallen into like a cesspool. And that'll <laughs> be like, everyone will mock it. It'll be on every channel. I'm like, that, this, if, unless the person jumped into it and filmed themselves jumping into the cesspool, like this could be the most famous thing they have done for infinity generation. Like that idea, this unforgiving nature, this recording, this knowing, I just wanted to look at it and just because it's there doesn't, or we can do it, doesn't mean it deserves, like doesn't deserve further exploring. So yes, just because I can look at your house or like, I think, you know, you have to like, I read up, like you have to not Google every, like just, you know, this notion, even now that it's being like, uh, 
like aerosolized politically, mm -hmm. this idea that they're looking for someone's old tweet, that you can tear people down, like that the idea that you don't get to be human anymore and that we have, just because we have all this data and we make terms that are friendly, cookie and mining and whatever, mining not so friendly, not so friendly. anyway, but um, I, I just think we have to think about how we're using it in a non-didactic way. It's one paragraph in the book, which is also what literature does. It's not. A, a book fails, unless you're Orwell and that's his true nature, it can't lecture, it can't, it just has to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And you know what I thought about it? This, I did this, I was gonna do this project that everyone got fired and fell apart. I had this whole meta computerized thing. I wanna do some weird fiction thing. I like doing, anyone wants to work on something? I'll come paint your barn. I've been enjoying, back to the plays, I like working with people. But uh, this like super smart MIT guy had told me that when the phone doesn't know, this is probably totally wrong, you can correct me, but that's the best part of writing fiction. It just has to spark ideas. <laughs> but when the phone doesn't know exactly where you are, that's a big, part in this book is the X, Y, and Z axis. It's not because the phone doesn't know where you are. I think he said it was under Clinton, but they don't want those missiles that can find you hitting this chair and not Glenn's chair. They want to make a little fuzzy that you maybe don't get the right one of us. I think they, he said that a little fuzziness is put into the data in our phone that that's like mandated. There's like a four foot or whatever it is that it's meant to be a little fuzzy. So my point is, I guess that state in my brain, which is just because you can do something and have access to something doesn't mean it's okay. And I just want to think about how we treat each other, how we talk to each other, not to be all preachy and whatever. I just wanted to look at how, back to someone who thinks this is a, re we're in a reality, stage reality, novel reality. I guess I just wanted to look like the internet is its own reality. Like the idea that you're a mean person there, it means you're mean. Right. You know, I just wanted to look at that. Thank you, man. Okay, let's, let's go. Thank you. All right. I want to give some of you the opportunity to, to get him started. So um, step up to the mic if you have any questions at all. Nothing. The pregnant pause is my favorite. The pregnant part. pause. Is there walking? There's walking. There's not walking. Okay. Um, oh, here comes someone. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sure. Thanks. No there one else is going to. There we go. There we go. Okay. Do you want to go first? Sure. Please. Um, I'm curious, now having heard you speak and you write short stories, what's your <laughs> editing process like? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, that is, uh, yes, I always say the whole point of me giving talks is called, uh, this is why I don't have a radio show. This is why Glenn doesn't have me on the podcast. Um, <laughs> You know what, that's why I think, you, back to finding forms and true forms, I think in circles, I talk in circles, everything is just untethered, and you know, I've, I, I have a memory from high school of telling a, like five stories at once at a party to new people, and them looking panicked, and a, a good friend being like, just stay with it, you know, <laughs> it's gonna, don't panic, keep listening, all the punchlines will come. It's just a five, it's a five part simul joke. Anyway, <laughs> so yes, I, that is a true compulsive, in case this book doesn't make it clear or Glenn's question, like a real kind of where religion and OCD and all that stuff mixed together. I love cleaning a sentence. That is my chance. Everything I write is at least twice as long, if not longer. I draft compulsively. The reason I'm sitting up here is because a story I wrote, The 27th Man, that I started when I was 19 and drafted till I was 28. It's all of like, you know, 15 pages, <laughs> but I must have like six or seven feet of drafts. Yes, that is your chance. Uh, like this is our, supposed to be our interaction. Like the novel, it, it's just, it's not about, everyone's really busy and I respect all that, but I, I just believe if there's, like, I think of a book like Jenga, you know what I'm saying? You can't like set up Jenga and be like, I win. You did it win. <laughs> and you also, if you pull it and it falls down, you also lost. Like you just, I think, I, I guess back to that religious self, I feel like books have their true form. And if you love them, they become perfect to you, you know? And, and uh, there's a whole thing, every culture has it. There's like Navajo blankets, the Jews have it, Islam has it. But I also believe back to their perfection, they should have a flaw because they're made by human beings. So when that, when I, after first edition, we're like, there's a missing comma, I'm like, Mwah. now we're done. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes, brave sir. Thank you. Who is in the Bible, Yo who jumped into, Yochanan, who jumped into the water? Um, my question is about uh, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank, and I would love that for it was a very, humanistic short story, but it, it really, the end scene with the pantry, it, it jolted me a little bit. Uh, it kind of shook me up and I thought about it for, for a while. Um, 
I think it jolted me because it brought me back to a particular memory. I promise I won't turn you into my therapist right now. There's a point to this. Um, I take, I take <laughs> Cobra. <Anyway>. Uh, <laughs> It brought me back to a memory uh, when I was in Jerusalem during Shavuos and I was sort of trying on the hat of being maybe a little more Jewish and it was the message I got from um, some Orthodox Jews sort of lecturing during that time was that maybe I wasn't Jewish or not just as Jewish but maybe not Jewish at all uh, in their terms. And I was thinking, and this might be oversimplifying it, but what do you think about this idea that maybe one of the issues with Mark and some Orthodox Jews, not all, but is that maybe there is a lack of empathy for people who are less Jewish or defined as not the same kind. Oh, you're talking about patrilineal descent? Is that where we're headed or sure. things like or that? Or the issue of like empathy between Jews. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is, you know, this is what obsesses me, which is like, yes, how we treat our, like, I guess it's more, I remember friends, you know, uh, just wanting to be accepted for different things that weren't gonna be accepted. There's different fights to have and different people like, uh, I'm filling in a whole narrative and I don't know the conversation and I'm making it about one thing or the other, but like that's the idea, like uh, I really work on it. I so fear authority, like it's just extraordinary. I need confirmation of everything. I'm almost 50 years old, which I can only say for a little bit longer. So uh, like one thing is like, who cares what that guy thinks? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the main freaking thing. Like, and I work so hard on that. I, I, I guess, again, this is what just, if we take it out of Jews and take it to Israel, Palestine, where I said like, oh, I'm in Jerusalem and my Palestinian neighbor is in Il Quds. Like, not a difference of opinion that Martin Indyk could fix that we could have, but like, I mean, like two different realities, like inhabiting the same city. Like, we brought it to America now. Like, if I put up those things, like, okay, two pictures. Like, let's break this room down. Which inauguration has more people? That's not a difference of opinion. That's two running realities. So I think the hardest, what I see about the world, like, you know, my brain, it's, it's so extreme now. It's literally ripping this country apart and the planet. You know what I'm saying? We need to save ourselves. But yes, you have, we have, you don't, you know what? Like, if it's your issue, don't bend, don't give up fight for it, obviously, but there has to be some empathy for different realities, but you can also reject that. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the point. If you're, like, racist, like, fuck off. You know what I'm saying? That's not something I'm interested in. You know, like, that you don't have a valid point. Like, we can, there's things we have to not bend. You know what? This whole thing, <laughs> well, your whole question is we tried, the question is empathy. Everything's getting bent. There still is right and wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's two sides to everything except for things that are just wrong. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> except for climate denial. You know what I'm saying? I watch people, you know, starving in Malawi because of the cars. I lived there for a year. I watch people dying, like kids starving to death because there's no rain and then there's a flood. Like, so you can deny it here, but you're, there's people dying. You know what I'm saying? And we're up net, like, so. My point is, yes to empathy, yes to bending, yes to communication, but if someone's just wrong, who cares what they think and you know, fight the good fight. Thank you. Um, have, have members of the Orthodox community come to any signings and, or, or talks like this? And uh, if yes. so, how's that go? Oh, uh, I owe my career, there's so many people, like there's just, I really owe Glenn so much, like I can think of different, you know, people along the way have been so central to me being here, but this uh, editor who just, I, again, like I'm, you know, when we talk about our meritocracy, I wish I knew to try, like that's the thing. It's not what's, maybe grad school matters, but really what matters is telling kids and people you can do something, you know? I just thought I can't be a writer till this woman told me like, why don't you try? Like I just thought it's not, I'm not allowed, I'm not, you know, like of this world, anyway, she was a religious woman and she used to tell me like, you're getting off way too easy. What I find so beautiful about different communities and maybe that, thank you, that's such a good alley-oop to your question, is people willing to be, come out of their comfort zone. I have so much, so, like it's really moving to me. Yes, I've had like people from all streams, but like, you know, Hasidic people, like really, I find it so beautiful. That's what literature does. I remember, uh, he, I don't think Rabbi al is here, but like when I was living in Jerusalem, he wrote this book, Cool Aids that I love, which is about like Lebanon and the Lebanese war and AIDS and you know, homosexuality and a whole billion different things. But it was about Beirut and it's like, we were at war, I was living in Jerusalem and we're at war with Lebanon. And like I read this book in Jerusalem and it just makes me think, oh my God, Beirut is exactly 
like here, and I give it to a French friend. Who, I watched that one copy, back to physical books and my love for them, why I love physical books. I watched that copy move till this super religious scholar got it and like loved it, and I thought like, yeah, that's, you know, the question you're asking is what books should do. It's not taking action, it is like this, it is a shared consciousness. There is no crime in reading, there, no reading should be forbidden, you know what I'm saying? Like no book should be banned, you know, like I just, I have to think about if I can think of it. It's like Mein Kampf, anyway. But nonetheless, like I, yes, I found the support from the community so beautiful and moving to me and really meaningful to me, because again, it's about judging a soul. Like today, as I, my agent taught me before I started writing, like go on 20 years ago, but she's like, if you do great on stage, you'll sell a copy. If you like hurt someone's feeling, they will tell their children and their children's children what a terrible person you are. <laughs> anyway, but I feel like, you know, what, what it is with writing, it's about like, it, you are, I remember a friend being shocked when a stranger was really like intimate with me and she was like, that person, he didn't even know you. And I was like, but he did, we shared a brain. Like I put my brain in here. If you read it, like if it works, we are sharing a consciousness and I find it really beautiful when people from worlds where literature is maybe a little more dangerous to them, take that leap, it's, it's unbelievably rewarding. It really is. Uh, I want to thank the NEA for allowing me to have this conversation with my oldest friend and for, to, and for you coming here so that you can see a glimpse of why I love him so much. Uh, thank you all and uh, have a good night. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for signing.